Hey friends, we've got a great episode on tap, but before we get there, just one more reminder. We now are up to six of us who are going to be at our meetup in Traverse City, Michigan. We're going to have a really good time. Hope you can make it too if you're in that area. Just shoot me a message. It's going to be next Wednesday. That is the 5th of July at 6 p.m. at the Seven Monks Tap Room. And hope you can make it out with us uh, 6 p.m. Just shoot me an email, joe at stackybedjamins.com, or uh, hit us up on social media and let me know that you're coming. And also, our big 500th episode coming. We've got a couple of people who have shared some successes they've had in the five years since we've been podcasting. We'd love to hear your success too. So here's what you do. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail and tell us something good that's happened to you. And you know what? I'm loving the few that we've gotten. We haven't gotten nearly enough. I would love to hear all the great stuff. We're celebrating 500. Celebrate with us by celebrating some good stuff that's happened in your life the last five years. We're going to do some virtual high fives and uh, hope you can join it. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. Really easy. You just leave a voicemail either on your phone or on uh, your computer. If your computer's got a microphone, it's super easy. All right, let's get to it. Pre-recorded from Joe's mom's basement, welcome to another Rewind episode of The Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern, but all the guys in my competitive fidget spinner team just call me the Fintern. Well, we've got a big show for you today. So Joe and OG are hiding behind the water heater, and I've told them about five times that I can see them, but they're pretending like I can't. One of the pieces today's roundtable talks about is, can Donald Trump pick stocks? And before you think that we've gone all political, this piece is from two years ago, when the Donald had just begun his run for the presidency. And I hate to disappoint you, but it's not at all political. But you won't be disappointed because, as always, the Roundtable Group talks about lots of topics on this episode. Thayash Shefchik joins us on this episode, and it's a lot of fun. Which is why we're bringing it back to end my week on the basement. Well, now it's time for me to finish sweeping the floors. And time for you to enjoy this show from mid-2015. Enjoy, Finn Turn Out. In a world where overspending, debt, and keeping up with the Joneses rules us all. Where the voices from the merchants, restaurants, and credit companies lord over the common man. Out of the darkness, like a beacon of hope, comes a new voice. A voice that's rich and creamy, like your favorite butter, and delicious like cheeseburger pizza on your diet cheat day. It's The Stacking Benjamin Show. What's better than another Monday and a cup of coffee? How about Monday, a cup of coffee, and your favorite podcast? Live from my parents' basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe Salci. I average Joe money on Twitter. And on today's podcast, we're talking presidential candidates again. Donald Trump talks about his picks when it comes to stock and talks about how great they are. But are his stock picks really that great? And we've got an awesome roundtable today that our review of the movie Ant-Man and more. And here he is, the guy who Ant-Man, the one and only OG. That didn't work very well. I tried. Swing and miss, but it was good. It almost made it. Nope. Just like this podcast, every Monday almost makes it. We come so close and we just come back another Monday for another shot, another shot, another shot. It's hard to beat perfection. I know. How is life in the heat? Are you talking to me? Yeah. No, I'm talking to the listeners. Oh, I didn't know if it was a rhetorical question. I don't live in the heat. What are you talking about? Yeah, no idea. I'll tell you what, man. Well, I mean, you're here across the card table from me. It is hot. Well, we have air conditioning. I mean, we don't live in a in the jungle, like outside. I wish mom would work on I the do, air conditioning. I do not. This, uh, is, this is ugly. I do not walk outside when it's 103. I can tell you that much. It's funny because here in Texarkana, it's so much different than when I was in Michigan. In Michigan, you know, these were the awesome months. These were the great months. And now it's like, holy, let's get to September, baby. I actually don't don't mind it here in Texarkana this time of year because it's only been the last week That's that has gotten really kind of kicked it up a notch. Yeah, we finally got into the hunt. It has uh, been a mild summer. 
My favorite is when people from the great white north put stuff on the Facebook. Like, oh my God, the heat, heat warning. I can't take it. And I look at the temperature. I'm like, it's like 86. Is there like a heat wave coming? Or is this is the heat wave? Because it's like 86 at 6 in the morning here. Come on, Minnesota, grow a pair. Right? And then you get the snarky comments like, well, some of us don't like working outside when it's so humid. Like, oh, okay. Well, you know what? The rest of us don't like working outside when it's snowing. So yes. enjoy and. Yeah, complain all you want July 20th. Or you can be like weather. mom's because neighbor Doug who doesn't like working outside ever. In two months from now, it'll be 41 and raining. Right. And you are at 41 and rain. I just want you to remember this, folks up north. At 41 and rain, you are a mere nine degrees from snowfall. That is not that far. And OG's going to be here in the basement just laughing. Oh, I'll be still wearing shorts, baby. Laughing. Yeah, and you know who else has a great fall, spring, summer, whatever, people that go to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi, that's S-O-F-I. You know why? They are the marketplace leader when it comes to personal loans, student loans, and mortgages. Check out the great rates, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi. What I like best about SoFi, a couple things. If you're getting a mortgage, number one, you only need to have 10% down, only 10% equity in your house before PMI is gone. That's because they trust your high credit score when you head to SoFi. And then the second thing I like, when it comes to refinancing your student loans, whether it's a private loan, a public loan, whatever type of loan it is, you can structure those in a variety of different ways. And just like good businesses like to have lots of of flexible options, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi brings you lots and lots of options. And as I said earlier, low interest rates and the place to go when you're not just looking for low interest rates, but for financial products that are better, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. And I want to talk about something here with Magnify Money that we haven't talked about yet because I got a note from Nick saying they just started working on the small business lending market. If you've got a small business, he has some tips. Number one, make sure you have a separate small business checking account. Number two, make sure you pay yourself a formal salary to your personal account. And number three, have at least one small business credit card using your EIN to build a credit history through your business. Number four, have a social media profile, especially LinkedIn company page. If you do those things, you'll find lots of new options. Nick has found 17 of them that they put at Magnify Money. Stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money. If you go to their blog, he's written a piece, 17 options for small business loans, and they'll obviously continue to rank the best. We're ranking the best stuff today, man. On Monday, we've got them all ranked from best to worst. We have coming up on Wednesday, by the way, we do have a ranking, our top five coming up on Wednesday. But today, a great roundtable. But before that, let's do the headlines. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins Headlines. We've talked about politicians a couple times on the show, OG. We talked about Mike Huckabee recommending that maybe we should all get our social security in a lump sum. We also talked about Marco Rubio's issues. Well, as you know, OG, we don't talk politics on Stacking Benjamins, but when these candidates bring out political ideas, we talk about them. We have a candidate here, though, talking not about a political idea, but talking about what he did with his stocks. And Donald Trump, when he disclosed his positions, his formal disclosure of not his net worth, but his assets, he disclosed his assets. And when he did that, he talked about his stock positions. And this piece by Michael Santoli, is Trump really the great stock picker he claims to be. It says, leave it to Donald Trump to turn a bureaucratic disclosure form into a chance to boast about how good he is, even at things he doesn't try hard at. Because he really, you know, doesn't try to be a stock picker. So it's impossible, according to this article, it's impossible to know exactly when he bought and when he sold. But based on his disclosure, Santoli goes through and looks at a few of the Donald's stock picks. And it looks like he has a professional money manager handling it because of the fact that the positions are pretty even they're broken down the way that a professional money manager would handle them, which is good to see, especially since the Donald focuses on real estate generally, have somebody right. handle the stuff that he's not good at. The piece I found interesting was the per share cost of his 12,800 shares of Apple is $66.43 adjusted for the stock split subsequent to his purchase. And that was Apple's price in early February, 2012. So he kind of ran it back. So he booked an 18 and percent gain in Apple as of January 31st, 2014, and he missed a subsequent 75% surge since then. He bought Facebook, 
paying just over $19 a share, which must have been in mid to late 2012. Just once again, looking at charts, no idea if that was exactly, but if that's what he paid and he bought it publicly, that's what he got. And he wrote it until the stock tripled. Since he was out of stock, it's gone up another 43%. Biggest losers were energy stocks losing 36%, Noble Energy nearly 10% and Enbridge. Basically, what Santoli does that I thought was pretty cool, OG, he goes through and he looks at his stocks and you know what he finds out? The Donald's stock picks were very close to what the S&P 500 did. He did very close to what the average stock picker would have done had they bought the S&P 500. The funny thing is, you and I know a lot of individual investors, he kicked their butt. Well, if he did as good as the S&P over the last couple of years, he did a fantastic job. But I would wonder from a diversification standpoint, how is he positioned internationally with smaller companies or emerging markets and that sort of thing? But this just goes to prove a point, I think, that you can own a whole bunch of different stuff and then all you end up with is a really, really, really expensive index fund. Right. You know, because that's all he has. I mean, I don't know what his positions look like. You added off a couple of them. But if it's really close to the S&P and he's paying a manager to do that, why not just have it be an IVV? You know, the S&P 500 index fund, iShares, S&P 500, Which or is the Vanguard IVV. index fund, and just pay much less cost. It all just boils down to the philosophy, right? And if you think that you can beat the market, then it doesn't matter what the cost is because you think that you can. Well, and that's the thing. If you're Donald Trump, I mean, you're buying stocks to hold on to money, not necessarily to make more money. I mean, are you buying stocks to go crazy and make a ton of money? So, No, I was just having this conversation with a client a couple of weeks ago. Great, great investment prowess, nice net worth, had done a great job of accumulating money. And I said, you know, what's the point from here on out? Are you trying to go from 2 million to 10 million? Or are you just trying to make sure you never run out of money? Because you're trying to make sure you never run out of money then that your investing philosophy is a lot different. It's more of a protection type of thing. You want growth in there, obviously, but I think that there's a big difference in how you would invest. At least this would be my guess. I don't know anybody that has $7 billion or however much Donald Trump has. Well, that's why I'm surprised that he's bragging about how well that he did. I didn't even mention that part of the article, but part of his disclosure was him, of course, saying very prominently that he made a killing in stocks and that more people should be like him. Yeah. He also uh, bankrupted four companies and (laughs) is on his third wife. So that's great too. But he only likes winners. He's also sitting on modest losses, it says, on his $10 million investment in three hedge funds run by John Paulson. Once again, that doesn't really bother me because hedge funds, if they're really being run as to hedge risk, a guy like him having a hedge fund that has lost a little bit of money in a huge market swing up because it's being so defensive to make sure it holds on to cash. With his money, the right thing, yeah. yeah, with his money, that's not a bad thing. It's funny how, depending on your net worth, we look at things differently. There really is no reason for the Donald to brag about growth. I mean, none. On the other side, when he does brag, it turns out that he's doing the same thing the index did. doesn't matter how much money you have. You can make a nice diversified portfolio out of five ETFs and some cash, 795 trades, be done with it. <laughs> Let's walk across the basement here to my dad shortwave and dust this off. See if we can get the greatest minds in financial writing and a new voice in financial writing that we're excited to talk to, but we'll save that for later. Let's start in the desert where normally we say that's Greg McFarland territory, but now it's Paula Pant territory from Afford Anything. It's true. I have moved to the desert, the Mojave Desert, and I live in Las Vegas. However, at the moment, I am broadcasting out of Colorado. Are you really? What? Yeah, I totally am. <laughs> so I am at the very beginning of what's going to be a solid month on the road. Colorado, then Costa Rica, then Switzerland. Well, too bad you don't go anywhere, Paula. I know. My life is so boring. Now, tell us the truth. Did you have to get out of town because Greg came back to town? <laughs> exactly. We actually time it so that neither <laughs> of us will be there. The restraining order was going to kick in. <laughs> But let's talk to the man who is in the desert right now. I believe he is Greg McFarlane from Control Your Cash and Investopedia. Indeed I am. I don't know what direction you're going in today, but I checked it and I live seven minutes of longitude west of Paula. So you might want to remember that for a future reference. Well, that's good because we can still go east to west then. So that's fine. So have you guys hooked up in Vegas yet? Have you gone out to lunch, done any of that crazy stuff? Do you want to take this or should I? (laughs) Go for it, Greg. Not only that, she's fed my cats. (laughs) Uh, what do I do with that? I don't know what I do. <laughs> I came home and they were still alive. So that's all I can ask for. That is good. Paula, the cat lover. That's very nice, Paula. I do what I can, man. 
And brand new blogger on the scene, but not new to this podcast. I've been talking to this guy on Twitter forever. And unfortunately, he's a Milwaukee Brewers fan, but he's got this cool new blog called It Pays Dividends. It's the one and only Thias Chefchik. Hey, nice recovery, Joe. <laughs> That's all right. With a name like Saul Sehi, you know, it's pretty easy. So what about those Brewers? Hey, last I saw, they're only like eight games out of the wild card right now. So just enough to give me hope and then crush my dreams again. So Of course, that's better than my Tigers, I think. Yeah. Well, You're from Detroit. What can you do? What can I do? So tell everybody about your new site. It pays dividends because this is pretty cool. Yeah. So it pays dividends is kind of stuff where I, I guess, look at different things in life. that You can kind of learn them, implement them, and then they'll continue to pay you dividends down the road. So this could be stuff from increasing your savings rate so that you continue to grow your savings throughout the years. Or it could be stuff like just looking for ways to streamline your day to, you know, be able to gain back a few extra minutes, be able to kind of spend it on time doing things that you really want to do. So kind of look at a little bit of everything and pass along what I find. That's neat. And not only that, I mean, you have a new blog, but you're not new to the financial community. You're a CPA? I am. Yeah. I work in a kind of a corporate finance accounting for a manufacturer here in the Midwest. So. Excellent. And if you told us the name, you'd have to kill us? Uh, more than likely. <laughs> well, let's move into the questions, guys, because we've got a great one. We're going to do something we normally don't do. Normally, OG and I take the listener letters, but I had this great letter from Deborah that brings up a lot of stuff about real estate. We've got one guy that knows a lot about taxes, at least two people that know a lot about real estate. So Deborah says this, like so many, when the market was down, I bought another home, cheap, but didn't want to take a huge loss or carry two mortgages while trying to sell my condo. So... Deborah turned the condo into a rental, but now not loving being a landlord all that much and also am not willing to take a huge capital gains hit selling it. She's asking if we have any advice on doing a 1031 exchange. So I thought, Thais, if you don't mind kicking this off, there's a lot of people out there don't even know this thing exists. What's a 1031 exchange? All right. Yeah. A 1031 exchange, which is, I guess, also known as a like kind exchange, is when you take you are like a trade, a business, an investment asset that you own and you sell it and then use the proceeds to purchase another similar asset. You know, example, selling a rental property and using the funds to purchase an apartment building. And by doing a 1031 exchange, you're potentially able to defer any of the capital gains tax that you would have had to pay due to the sale by kind of rolling them over to this new asset. It seems to me like these can be pretty attractive. Greg, have you done 1031 exchanges before? I live with the woman who once operated the largest 1031 exchange company in the Southwest. Well, there it is. <laughs> in fact, that's kind of how we met. So, and to reinforce Thias's point, and by the way, Thias Shefchik, we have now set a record for it. That is the most voiceless post-alveolar fricatives in one name I think I've ever seen. <laughs> but he's right. You can avoid the capital gains tax hit or at least kick it down the road, but in Deborah's case, only if you buy another condo. And even if you do that, you do have 45 days to find one. And if, I think it's six months to close the sale. The clock is ticking on the exchange, if not necessarily on the tax bill. When it comes to like assets, and I'll leave this for either one of you guys, is there a definition of how like, I mean, can she buy a house that's a lot more expensive? Does that have to be in the same ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 range or what's the deal? Yeah. I mean, you can... For real property, the definition's pretty wide open. You know, if you're selling a condo, you don't necessarily have to buy another investment condo. You know, you could buy land, things like that. But normally, you know, it's most beneficial to try to get in the same range because depending on if you buy a investment property that is less than the one that you're selling, you have the potential of having to pay some capital gains tax on the difference between what you're selling it for and then what you're purchasing the next one for. So there's a lot of strategy that, you know, it's going to go into that to make sure you don't end up having to pay any taxes on it. Yeah, but still, she could defer a big piece of the capital game and only get minimally hit. Yeah, correct. Okay. Well, Paula, let's get you in here because the one thing that disturbed me about her letter was that, you know, she just doesn't like being a landlord anymore. And I think that takes a certain type of person, doesn't it? It does. The first thing that struck me when I read this letter were two things. Number one, if she wants to do a 1031 exchange, that implies that she wants to buy another property, but she already owns her own primary residence. So if she was buying another property... I assume that would also be a rental property. So I don't see how this solves the problem of her not being a landlord. Yeah, it doesn't solve it at all. Exactly. So, well, and I actually, I wrote her about that. I said, well, why do you want to do a 1031 exchange if you're telling me you don't want to own another property? She said, well, I'm kind of open to it. So uh, 
<laughs> All right. Well, then let's back the truck up a little bit and let's talk about a couple of issues there. Number one, the term landlord concerns me a little bit because, I mean, yes, if you own an investment property, you are a landlord. But that means that has an implication that you are the person who is conducting the showing, screening the tenants, call, repairing the toilet yourself or calling the plumber. You don't necessarily have to do that. You can hire a property manager who handles all of that for you. I know a ton of people, I get readers who email me all the time and say, I don't want to pay a property manager, but I really hate doing all of the management myself. So I'm thinking about just getting out of the game entirely. That doesn't make any sense, dude. Hire the property manager, stay in the game. Greg, do you have property managers on your property? Hell yes. Yeah. Spend the 9% and hire yourself a property manager. Way less hassle. I mean, I hate doing yard work. That doesn't mean I'm going to burn my property down. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Thais, do you own any properties? Just my own personal, so. Yeah. The interesting thing for me about this is, is I don't know, if she's on the fence. Paula, one thing that comes to my mind is that Deborah says she doesn't like being a landlord, yet I think that if she had some systems, I mean, not just a property manager, but a system of how to do it, it would make it a lot easier. Well, it seems as though she needs a system, yes. She also needs a strategy. She didn't enter into the real estate business with a clear strategy in mind. Does she want to be, if she's open to having another rental property, does she want to focus only on class A residential or does she want to kind of go into class C stuff, you know, like these are all questions that you ask yourself at the beginning when you're creating a business strategy and she doesn't have that. And that's probably why she's running into problems right now. But I see tons of people that don't start off with a strategy. Greg, when you started, did you have a strategy? Oh, hell no. I wish I had. And it took me a couple months to formulate one because the cash flow was going in the wrong direction. Well, one more thing about 1031 exchanges that I have to add though, it's not just real estate. You can do one for, and I've seen this firsthand, boats. In fact, vessels, barges, tugs, industrial steam and electric generation systems, railroad cars. Got any railroad cars you want to upgrade? You can defer the taxes on them. <laughs> I wonder how they added all that stuff. Or did those get added or was that all part of the original legislation? I mean, I don't know. I think it's in the original text of Internal Revenue Code, subsection 1031, hence the name. Yeah, that's crazy. Let's move on, guys, to our next piece, which comes from bankrate.com. This is a retirement piece, how to supercharge your retirement savings, even if you don't feel like it, by Shana Steiner. I don't know anybody who doesn't feel like supercharging their retirement savings. I've heard the word supercharge. I want to supercharge everything. Isn't that right, Paula? Oh, totally. Supercharge is my middle name. <laughs> That's right. Thias, what's interesting is I'm not actually- no, that no, it isn't. And I know because I've seen her mail. <laughs> <laughs> Paula uh, doesn't have any secrets anymore. No, it's not all, for me. all out there now. The bidding starts at a hundred bucks. <laughs> I'm not that interested really in the article, but what's funny that I thought about this article was there was a line that someone said, and I'm going to see if I can find it. Oh, that you have to supercharge your retirement savings. You have to know what to do. You have to have some baseline knowledge. And then they go into a little bit what they think baseline knowledge is. But I thought I've got three people that kind of know what baseline knowledge maybe should be. Greg, on that baseline knowledge, what does that mean to you? For me, it's understanding the concept of delayed gratification. If you're already on the treadmill that involves punching a clock until you turn 65 and then drawing from your savings, knock yourself out. But understand that it isn't a case of merely I'm going to work, then I'm going to play, then I'm going to die. You need to have at least a modicum of mathematical knowledge here. How long do I plan to live? Will I have enough cash flow to cover me? And not just to cover me, but to give me a comfortable life. Dice, is there a tax piece that needs to be added to that? I mean, obviously, you want to try to get into the most advantageous tax situations for, you know, what your situation is, what you're trying to accomplish. So, you know, just having an understanding of these different vehicles and what they can do. I mean, working in the kind of the accounting department at our current company, I have a big role kind of in our 401k administration. And I usually sit in with us, like our CFO and help administer the thing. And just seeing the employees of the company not really have a clear understanding of what's going on, you know, offering them education and still not really taking those kind of plunges to learn more about what they can be doing to help better them off in the future. You know, there's definitely a room that for knowledge and education and be able to kind of figure these things out, you know, best plan for your future. Isn't it frustrating that you offer financial education and your employees don't take it? It's unbelievable. I mean, we offer everyone to kind of meet with our 401k administ administrators, you know, quarterly, biannual basis. 
And we're lucky if we have three or four people, and those are normally the people that don't necessarily need to be meeting with them. Right. That's the way it always is. My cousin's a teacher, Paula, and he said that every time they do parent-teacher conferences, there's a line of all A students' parents, right? So one kind of goes with the other. Right, right. Chicken and egg. Yeah. So for you, baseline knowledge to know when it comes to investments, what baseline knowledge should somebody have if they're going to supercharge their savings? When it comes to investments, I would say early and often. And I I feel like that's kind of cliche and everybody should know it. But you know what? There are probably people who don't. So invest early, invest as often as you can. Don't be afraid to invest in small amounts, particularly if there aren't any fees associated with making those small purchases. And kind of what we touched on earlier, have a strategy. Don't just like throw money at things on the assumption or hope that the asset will appreciate. Have a plan in place for precisely what you want to do and how you're going to get there. But Greg, that's the part that people are afraid of is because I agree with Paula, invest early and often. And I can hear people driving down the road right now as they're listening to this saying, but where? Like what baseline knowledge should somebody have about the specific investment they're going to invest in before they get there? Well, you can order a copy of Control Your Cash, Making Money Makes Sense. The I book walked that right Penzo into that. called The Greatest Personal Finance Book Ever Written. And that's available on Amazon. And, <laughs> and just understand the, the, the different types of asset classes and security classes. But more importantly, I mean, yeah, you need to ask yourself, how can I start building assets today? Whether you just enter the workforce or whether you're in your 60s, sit down with a pen and paper. Your calculations don't even have to be accurate, but you do have to start somewhere. Yeah, good point. Thias, for your new blog, are there specific assets that you're going to start with because they're maybe easier to explain that somebody can start to dive into this stuff if they're brand new? Yeah, I mean, I want to just kind of start with something pretty simple. Just the fact of you don't need to be scared of equities and stocks. I mean, conversations I've had with a lot of people, you know, friends, colleagues, you know, even my wife, there's always kind of the fear starting out of, the stock market's going to go down. As much money as you put in there and you can make money, you're just going to end up losing it. If you're just starting out, you need to be comfortable with the fact that, you know, over the long term, stocks normally go up. You can't be scared off from something just because of a couple one, two year periods that put fear in a bunch of people. You just need to kind of look at a long term focus and move on from there. That's great advice. Yeah. You don't have to look at it all that often. Paula, how often do you look at it? At my stock portfolio? Yeah. Probably once or twice a year. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yep. Let's move on because now I'm going to go the exact opposite way because we talked about building more savings and let's move to CNN Money with our quirky article of the day. This guy, Faraz Jaka, he's made millions playing poker, owns almost nothing and he's never been happier. So Greg, this is a guy who supercharges savings and then gave it all away and he says it's a better way to go. What do you think? He's a douchebag. Homeless (laughs) is more than a little misleading. (laughs) Seriously. I mean, To call himself homeless, and he puts it right there in his Twitter bio, I know a 60-ish couple who fuel up the Winnebago and hop from resort to resort all year long. Are they homeless? I think untethered is a more accurate adjective. This guy is just a little too proud of the fact that he lives out of a suitcase. I mean, good for him, but stop bragging that you have no possessions. This is an insult to real homeless people. Yeah, that is true. I like the untethered thing better. Thias, when you look at this, I thought it was interesting that he said that he had this feeling, though, that he was starting to run the rat race. And I think all of us, to some degree, as we have, you know, we maybe get married, we have kids, we get a career, we start feeling like he calls it being pot committed, where you're in the hand whether you want to be or not. Yeah. And you know what? There's certain people that the traditional American dream is not necessarily the thing that they're searching out or what's going to really make them happy. Obviously, this seems to be a bit of an extreme case. But I mean, you know, one of my favorite things from this thing is when you go through and he uh, lists what's in his backpack he's been living out of for four years, the guy doesn't know. I really don't know if he's all together to begin with. (laughs) Like why? Well, you know, just the fact of it almost seems like he's over exaggerating the amount of stuff that he's actually carrying with him because when you're going through everything that he says, you know, he's been living on for this time, there seems like there's quite a few things that are maybe being overlooked. So it almost might be that he's kind of overselling the sacrifices that he's making uh, yeah. through all this. Yeah. The selling the lifestyle. Paula, he doesn't have a toothbrush. That's kind of gross. That's, that's exactly what I noticed. I looked at this and I was like, where's this list that he has? And I'm like, where's the toothbrush? But you're nomadic of all of us on, on this mm-hmm. podcast. You are the most nomadic. What did you think about him giving his stuff away and just going? I mean, you go to Burning Man. That has to resonate with you, dude. <laughs> You know, I kind of think this specific guy is a bit of a douchebag. 
<laughs> not to say that all people who have this lifestyle are that way, but just the way that this particular article was written, and I know a lot of the listeners aren't going to read this article or haven't written it, but just for the benefit of the people who are listening to this while you're driving, just know that there's this entire section of this article where he goes on this ridiculous humble brag about this time that he went to a Buddhist meditation retreat in Thailand. Look, I come from Nepal, a place where a lot of people like to go and practice yoga and meditate and then talk to all of their friends about how very spiritual they are. And when you buy into an image or an idea and you let your ego get all caught up in that and you start kind of one-upping each other in being hippier than thou, you're really no better than people who are doing the same thing, but via BMWs. It's all ego at the end of the day. And that's what I think that this specific guy kind of has based on the way he wrote this article. Greg, is there anything redeeming about this guy that maybe the average American Uber consumer should maybe take note of? Yeah, take note of the fact that he has money and he can do this. I mean, fine, you don't have furniture in a condo. Good for you. But you do have millions of dollars in winnings and an ownership stake in a caster board company. Why don't you drop that off at the foot of a statue of Buddha and see what happens? Be honest. I mean, you still have wealth. You've just chosen to configure it in a way that conveys lots of freedom. Good for you. I mean, I've done the same thing, kind of. I know Paula has. And if this guy wasn't enjoying a rate of return sufficient to let him trot the globe, I don't think he would be touting the values of quote unquote homelessness. He doesn't have to drop it at the foot of Buddha, drop it at the foot of Joe Saul Sihai. That's what I'm thinking. (laughs) <laughs> but anyway, so thanks for playing this week, guys. Let's talk about what's going on at your homes. Paula, you want to do the honors? What's going on at Afford Anything? Now that you're getting, well, you're not really getting settled because you moved to Vegas and then you leave. <laughs> exactly. You know, I am always on the road, but unlike this guy, I carry a toothbrush. <laughs> that, that is- <laughs> so on AffordAnything.com, there'll be some good stuff. Go check it out. But also on my Instagram feed, I will be posting photos from Vegas, Colorado, Switzerland, Costa Rica, wherever else on the globe I end up broadcasting out of next. So come check it out and, you know, follow the adventure via photo. It's always an adventure when you're around Paula Pant. (laughs) I've learned that the last couple of years. Greg, so what are you doing on Instagram? You have a big Instagram feed, huge following. I have Twitter and nothing else. Greg Vegas on Twitter. (laughs) Which is hilarious and not meant for children. (laughs) But the, <laughs> not meant for most adults either. Yeah. Well, what have and, you written at Investopedia? We haven't talked to you in forever. I miss you, man. So what's new at Investopedia? I miss you too. And mercifully, my editors at Investopedia have no knowledge of my Twitter account, unless they're listening to this podcast. <laughs> I wrote a piece about whether stock buybacks are a scam. Oh, that's interesting. I got to yes, read that is. one and I'll link to that because I definitely have an opinion. And Thias, thanks for playing with us this week. No, I appreciate the invite. It's been fun. Yeah. So tell us what's going on and it pays dividends. Uh, It pays dividends. I just put up an article talking about getting rid of the pro debt mindset that society currently has and, you know, just kind of fighting through that and realizing you don't have to have debt to enjoy life. Instead, go win at poker and hit the road, right? I'm signing up for my online poker account right now. (laughs) So. (laughs) Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just had a huge... Huge revelation. How cool would it be if someone sold ice cream that had both, wait for it, chocolate and vanilla? I bet that'd go over. I'm going to go work on that. I'm going to go do my due diligence, as the Mark Cubans of the world call it. But for now, I'll leave you with this trivia question. In 2015, the most expensive auction for a painting occurred. The name of the painting? Les Femmes d'Alger. Les Femmes d'Alger. Yeah, that's it. It was painted in 1955 and it sold for $179.4 million. So what's my question? Who painted it? I'll be back with the answer and I'm sure more details about my ice cream empire shortly. I'm so thankful we have two great sponsors for the Stacking Benjamins podcast. Our first one is Magnify Money. They've been a longtime sponsor of our show, as many of you know. And if you head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, like many of you have, you'll know why. And what I love about them is that Nick Clements, the CEO at Magnify Money, tells people that you can use the surfing strategy. You surf down to a 0% interest rate. And then when your interest rate starts to come back up, 
you surf to a different card. Nick Clements says that's a great strategy, but it also has some pitfalls. Uh, it's it's painful if you stay around when the promotional period is over, but it has, it's actually really, really easy to move the debt when you're done. So it's more laziness that gets people stuck in the balance transfer than, than anything else. Banks are betting on laziness. <laughs> That's a tagline right there. So whether you're comparing your checking account, savings account, or your credit cards, head to stackingbenjamins.com and surf safely. Don't be lazy. And here's the transition. How about this? First time I heard about SoFi, our other sponsor was from Nick. Nick, who you just heard from magnifymoney.com. And the reason was he said the SoFi was awesome. So I looked into him and guess what? Not only were they awesome, they decided to become our sponsor. I asked Dan Macklin how hard the process is when it comes to getting a loan from SoFi. It's really easy. You go to SoFi.com and apply. It takes about 10 minutes. We ask for a few pieces of information and then we will approve you or not approve you uh, instantly in the vast majority of cases. So within 10 minutes, you'll know if you have a rate, uh, what that rate is, and we'll show you calculations as to how much money you can save. So it's extremely quick and simple. Easy process, great people, and Nick at Magnify Money loves them. How great's that? Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi, S-O-F-I, and that'll tell Dan and the team over there at SoFi that we sent you And if the sponsor ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, right? Hey there, trivia fans. Who knew? Apparently, they've been doing vanilla and chocolate for ages. Some naming savant even came up with a name for it called Swirl. Man, it's hard keeping up with times these days. That's what I get for sticking with Orange Sherbert all these years. Well, I'll figure out a better way to make money later, but for now, let's tackle your thrilling trivia answer. And the question? In May 2015, the most expensive painting ever sold at auction happened. The painting was called Les Femmes d'Alger and was painted in 1955. It sold for $179.4 million. Who painted it? Pablo Picasso. Imagine how many swirl ice cream cones you could buy for that kind of dough. We get letters, OG. We get some great letters from the people who listen to the show. Thanks to everybody who's taken the time to write us a letter. This one that Doug brought down in the mail comes from Dan. Dan says pet insurance. He's wondering about pet insurance. He's read stories lately about pet insurance, not covering all the vet expenses, <laughs> and he's still torn on whether or not it's a good idea to get it. So he's wondering pet insurance. I have some oceanfront property in Idaho. I'd like to sell him as well. I do not think that you need pet insurance. Yes. My goodness. Well, that brings up... Is it grotesque just to say... No, I can't even say it. You can't. I can't say what I'm thinking. I think about 50% of the people that are listening probably are thinking the same thing that I'm thinking. The other 50% are thinking, what is he thinking? (laughs) The 50% who are with me, right? I got your pet insurance right here. I love my animals when I had them, but I would not have pet insurance under any circumstance. It reminds me of that comedy bit. I believe it was Louis C.K. who did it. He was talking about his kids wanted a bunny. No, it was uh, Robert Schimmel. Robert Schimmel. That's right. His kids wanted a bunny. Taking the buddy to the vet. Yeah. He's like, there's no way we're getting a bunny. And he takes a big, long drink of water. He's like protesting, right? His wife says, we're getting a bunny. He says, no, we're not getting a buddy. And he comes back to the microphone. He goes, anyway, so we're at the pet store. (laughs) Yeah. It's easy to say you don't need pet insurance when you don't have a pet at home that you love and adore. I currently do not. So I don't know that it's terribly important. Let's talk about the number one reason for insurance. I mean, there are catastrophic losses, right? Where you'd lose a lot of money in the event of something bad happening. But but when it comes to living things at your house, generally speaking, you insure the ability to bring home the bacon, right? So and if it, it's a pig, it is bacon. <laughs> if that is your pet. There it is. If so it's, that pretty much sums that up. Damn, we got it for you. If it's a pig, insure the bacon you know, out of No, you it. don't need to insure it because it already is bacon. It already. Get it? Yeah, I do. Yeah. It's baked in. Take the bacon is baked in. <laughs> right. So you want to insure the things that you can't afford to lose, right? An income stream, your ability to pay off the mortgage, your ability to send your kids to college. 
And if a little fluffy bear or foo foo, the, you know, your wiener dog has a slip disc or something, you know, actually you should get reverse insurance because if you didn't have a pet, it would be saving you all sorts of money. The reason you have insurance on your, <laughs> the reason you have insurance on your kids and only health insurance, hopefully you have health insurance on your kids is because if the health costs end up being high, but you don't have like life insurance or disability on your kids because how much money are they bringing in? They're not bringing in any. When it comes I found to your, out that my kids used 150 gigs of download holy, on Xbox in the last 20 days. Are you kidding me? They track it on the Xbox. You can go on Xbox and see how much data you've used. 150 gigs of data. I think we have a champion. That's Holy insane. moly. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what's funny. I think I'm going to punt on the pet, on the pet insurance. Yeah. I had a client who was a vet when I was practicing and he said, whenever the market, you know, everybody says the pets are as important as people, but every time that the, the economy would get bad, his, his business would crumble. Just because, completely dry up because yeah. if the kid gets sick, that's fine. If the cat's sick, cat's going to get over it. Um, One way or the other. Right. Next question comes from Vincent. Vincent asks about top 10 holdings. He says he's been listening to our show for the last couple of months since finding his podcast app and wants to say he really enjoys it. Thanks, Vincent. Thank you, Vincent. You talk about many topics in such a way that someone new like myself can understand. And for things I don't, gives me homework between shows. Keep up the good work. He wants to see how the allocation stocked up between the two 401ks held by his wife and himself using a Got trade account. He was surprised by what he found. They're both currently in a 2040 target date fund. She has. A, <laughs> Sorry, I just threw up a little in my mouth. Here Go it comes. On. She has nine funds inside of her target date fund. It's glorious. He has 13 in his. It's yummy. Through a different. And I family. bet he has $17 million. How much does he have? Does he I noticed have? my wife was enrolled in three blended funds, one of which admits it's intended for someone nearing retirement or already retired, and we're 38. I also noticed the top 10 holdings between much of our funds are in technology, which seems like a bit of an overlap. Wanted to know if you wouldn't mind discussing topics such as blended funds. How big a deal are the top 10 holdings in mutual fund and how much overlap is okay? Thanks for a wonderful show. He brings up a great, I love what he did digging into his funds and actually looking to see what he owns and surprise, surprise, he owns a bunch of the same Everything. Crap. You own everything. So this is one of the well, this is one of the eight great mistakes, right? The eight great mistakes. One of them is under diversification, meaning you've got a whole bunch of one thing. You see that a lot. As often you see over diversification. Client comes in and goes, "Look at all the stuff I have and how diversified I am." And you look at it and you say, "Well, yeah, but by diversifying into everything, you just own everything. There's no systematic diversification there at all." And I would I would suggest that having two 2040 funds comprised of 22 mutual funds is pretty much owning everything. So what do I think of them? I think that you should get rid of them by pretty much by nightfall, I think. Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> you could wait until tomorrow, I guess, to sell it. This is what you're finding, is that you have so much of the same stuff that you really own no diversification properties whatsoever in your portfolio. Yeah. So I think kind of, so he's done, you know, Vincent here has done kind of level 101, which is investigated where things are currently. And we don't beat people up over the decisions they've made in the past. It is what it is. Now, what we want to do kind of 201 is look at yours and Mrs. Vincent's portfolios as a family account and say, okay, well, you know, her 401k is at this company, well, let's just say Fidelity, and my 401k is at Vanguard, for example. I don't know. Well, maybe Fidelity has a really good international product. You know, the research and you say, boy, I really like this Fidelity International Fund. Or maybe you really like Fidelity's you know, small cap value fund. Treat all of your money as the portfolio and pick the best allocation you can for the family out of all of the products. And you may end up with a with wife's account that is a little bit of bonds and international and emerging market, which looking at it by itself looks really screwy. But in the context of the whole family, your portfolio and hers and your Roth IRAs and your brokerage accounts, put it all together. You may find that, hey, we're perfectly diversified across our entire family-wide portfolio, just in the individual accounts or not, but you take advantage of the really good stuff that you have in each one account. I love that, especially for people who have small company 401ks, because a lot of the time a small company can't afford a 401k that has a lot of different choices. And I've found people yep. that say, man, my 401k stinks. Well, maybe six of the eight funds stink, but it's hard to find a 401k where every single fund stinks. So maybe you've got one or two good funds and then build your IRAs around it or your spouse's account like you're yep. talking about. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, thanks to Vincent. That's a great investigation. He has just uncovered why 
being over diversified is really not being diversified at all. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks to Dan and to Vincent for the questions. If you've got a question for us, send those to me, Joe at stackingbenjamins.com or just fill out the contact form at the Stacking Benjamins website. You know, usually at this point in the show, G, we talk about people uh, leaving us reviews and want to thank everybody who's taken a minute to do that because that's helped us find a lot of new listeners over the last few years. It's been fantastic. Whenever I see people that say, hey, I just discovered you last month, it's pretty awesome to see that. But this time of year, just for the next couple of weeks, we ask people to do something a little different. We last year won a big award in the personal finance community called the Plutus Award, and it was really cool. And you helped get us nominated. Now, you can't help us win. There's a panel of personal finance bloggers that decide who wins, but you know what? It's just a win to be nominated. So that's coming up and the nominations are open right now. So head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Plutus. I'll tell you what happens every year around the Plutus Awards. Two years now we've been nominated for Plutuses in different categories. Last year was the first year they- Is it Plutus I or is Plutus is? Plutus E? Plutus Sorum. What if the capital, what if the, the plural Plutus is still Plutus? Oh crap. Like coffee? Yeah, it could be that. So- who knows? But, but we'll have to ask somebody who head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Plutus. That will take you. That's P L U T U S. That'll take you right to the Plutus website and nominate us in the podcast category. There's also humor category, best blog category. I mean, nominate us in pretty much every category. But, <laughs> but if you can help uh, get us uh, there for the Plutus Awards, best looking co host. We get a huge bump in listeners every year right after the Plutus Awards uh, just for being nominated. So if you can take a second, do that, we'd really appreciate it. That's it, man. We did it. Monday, went down, huh? Monday. Almost. Because for all those people that uh, just wanted to talk finance, see ya. At this point in the show, we talk movies. And you know what, OG? I actually, so I went to the theater to see Trainwreck. And we show up and the woman says, hey, the air conditioner is out in that theater. <laughs> Pass. So if that's okay, you can go in there or you can see something else. And generally speaking, our Cinemark Theater only has one movie at a time that I want to see. So generally, yeah, you're a real big the, fan of Cinemark. Yeah. Yeah. Huge, huge Cinemark. You love their um, process, their people. Yeah. For people that. It's a love hate relationship. For people that can't hear sarcasm, oh, geez, got that exactly right. I absolutely love Cinemark in a uh, don't love them at all kind of way. Uh, but the cool thing but was... But if you're wanting to sponsor us, Cinema, we right. love you to death. We can love you for a price. <laughs> It'd be fine. <laughs> if I had a nickel for every time I heard that. <laughs> Cinemark, we love you long time. <laughs> I had a nickel for every time somebody said to me, I can love you for a price. <laughs> How many times did Mrs. OG say that to you? <laughs> she says it every day. <laughs> So instead, the cool thing was there were two movies that I wanted to see. And so we saw this one instead starring Paul Rudd. The movie's called Ant-Man. Scott, I've been watching you for a while now. You're different. Now, don't let anyone tell you that you have nothing to offer me. Second chances don't come around all that often. I suggest you take a really close look at it. That's the voice of Michael Douglas. And every time that I review a Marvel movie for the show, OG, I say the same thing. I love Marvel since Disney took them over because you know that in Disney's hands, it's going to be on a scale of one to a hundred. It's going to be a 75 at least, right? They're going to come in. You're not going to waste your money. You're at least going to have a good time. Even the, the in the past five or six years, I can't think of a Marvel movie that I left going, yeah, that really wasn't worth the time. So Ant-Man stars Paul Rudd, as I mentioned earlier. Paul is a convict, except he is a convict who his crime he perpetrated. He actually broke into a guy's house who was a bad guy. So if it's possible to be a good guy slash vigilante at the same time, 
Paul Rudd's about as close as you're going to come. Estranged from his daughter, of course. Like, you have to be. If you're going to be a superhero, you have to be estranged from your kid. I think that's a rule of thumb. Estranged from your family. Spouse, a former spouse, is dating a guy who they live together. And, of course, uh, Paul Rudd's character doesn't like him. And, at the same time, he doesn't know it, but he's being tracked by Michael Douglas, who's come up with this technology that he's trying to hide. And he's trying to hide it specifically from Corey Stahl's character. And Corey Stahl is a guy that you and I have talked about. Every time we talk about Corey Stahl, we talk about, oh, gee, how good he is. And he plays a great, great bad guy. He was also a great Hemingway in, um, he was a great Hemingway in one of my, well, frankly, my favorite movie, Midnight in Paris. But he also was a great senator at the early, was it only the first season? I think, was he in the first season, the first two seasons of House of Cards? He was a uh, congressman in the first season. Just in the first season, yeah. And you know what? Half of the battle, I think, of these movies is doing the right casting because Michael Douglas is great. Paul Rudd is fantastic. Evangeline Lilly is great. Corey Stahl, Michael Pena. I mean, the people that are in this movie do a great job of their parts. It's well-written. Edgar Wright wrote it. He's the guy that wrote Scott Pilgrim. Uh, He wrote uh, Shaun of the Dead, wrote, you know, some classic movies, Hot Fuzz, which we also looked at here and really liked. So, man, Ant-Man, different than The Avengers, was a movie that was really light. It was really fun. It made fun of itself a lot of the time. It was, it tied itself in well with the other Marvel movies. They actually have a scene where he finds out that at the last second, he realized that he is inadvertently trying to sneak into an Avengers base. And so he's got to sneak in and then he fights one of the Avengers one-on-one and it's, it's pretty hilarious. I was in a theater full of people and everybody was laughing through the movie. Great, great stuff. Just another good, um, better than average Marvel movie. Like every, better than average. Yeah, huh? every Marvel movie I like better than average. I would say not as good as uh, you know. My favorite ones have been Guardians of the Galaxy was by far my favorite. But then I'd say that Captain America: Winter Soldier was probably number two. Uh, this would come down somewhere yeah, top, top. just below that. Yeah, yeah. Great, great time. You've taken your kids to Marvel movies, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think, I, this one I kind of was kind of weirded out by, but but if you said it's good, maybe I'll. Uh, you know, maybe the nanny will take him. Oh, that's me. Did you hear what uh, Paul Rudd said about the movie? He told no. his kid that he was going to play Ant-Man and his, his 10-year-old told him that's a pretty stupid character. <laughs> Can't you be a real superhero? Nice. And they kind of address that in the movie. And it's funny because halfway through the movie, you go, I can't believe I'm buying into this character, which is funny because you had Ryan Reynolds play the Green Lantern, right? The Green Hornet or the Green Lantern. Green Lantern. And I totally didn't believe it the entire movie. I thought, man, this is dumb. It should be one that we buy much more than Ant-Man, but they do such a great job. And it's funny, halfway through the movie, you know, Stan Lee, the creator of Marvel, he appears in all of his movies. And it's great because halfway through the movie, Cheryl's like, oh, we miss Stan Lee. And then when he comes in the movie, this time in this particular movie, the cameo is so obvious, like you can't miss that it. it's Stan Lee. Our whole theater cracked up at that. And I was very happy at the audience. And for a long time, listeners of the show, you know, every single time I go see a Marvel movie, people leave the theater, right? They leave. This time people stayed around through the original credits to see the first little, little Easter egg that they have. Right. There's two of them in this. You got to wait till the end end credits for an even bigger one, which actually uh, the bigger one, I won't spoil it, but it has to do with Captain America. So good stuff. Ant-Man, big thumbs up. Oh, gee, if I were you, I would see that one. Actually for you, I've been railing on you to see Mad Max. I think for you specifically, you'd like this. This is more of a layout for you to like. Okay. Well, I like taking my kids to the movies. Yeah. Nope. Great one to take your kids to. Hey, thanks to everybody who appeared on the show. Thanks uh, today also to Dan and to Vincent for the great questions. Thanks to everybody who added to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Plutus. Thanks to Magnify Money and SoFi, our sponsors. Uh, Go check them out. We'll see everybody back here on Wednesday. Wednesday, been a long time, OG. Top five. For a while, this podcast, that's all we did was top fives back in the way, way, way back machine. We're doing top five dumbest rules of thumb. That'll be on Wednesday. We'll see everybody back here then. Stacking Benjamins. This show is the property of the Free Financial Advisor, LLC, copyright 2015, and is produced by Joe Salcihai and edited by Joe and Isabella Bianca. Paula Pant appears courtesy of AffordAnything.com. 
You know, Paula always says you can't afford everything, but you can't afford anything. Greg wants to know how much Paula he can afford. That hoser Greg McFarland comes to us from the land of Tim Hortons and Brian Adams and the original Obamacare. He can be found at Control Your Cash in a Vestopedia and the front row of any Shania Twain concert. The part of Joe's mom's neighbor Doug has been nominated for an Oscar. Bad day, bad day for people who, uh, you see this headline about what hackers have done lately? I did. My brother called me right away. I said, dude, dude, you're so screwed. <laughs> he said, I don't, ha- I don't have anything to do with that. Hackers threaten to link data. When this comes out, this will probably actually be over this whole problem. But hackers... You know what they need to do, though? This is the thing. They don't need to release the information. You're talking about the Ashley Madison yes. breach. And Ashley Madison, by the way, for people that don't know, it's a site people Fantastic go to. Fantastic name of a website. A site that people want to go to that want to have an online affair. They're still married and they're looking for love in all the wrong places. Wasn't that the name, the country song? I don't know. This is a huge opportunity if you're a hacker and you're listening to this show. <laughs> you're going to give hackers this advice for free. This is for free. You don't have to release the data. You just have to call the people on the phone. Hey, Bob, this is Joe. Turns out I'm one of the hackers from that Ashley Madison deal. Anyway, so I've got your credit card receipt here. And um, can I talk to your spouse? Pretty much all of your transaction history, as well as all of your transcripts from your uh, conversations with uh, what's her name? Uh, Susan? Anyway, I just thought we could come to an arrangement uh, whereby I turn this over to you and, um, you know, you just make it go away. What do you think about that? It's fabulous. I mean, seriously, Absolutely what person would fabulous. go? I mean, unless you were on the other side of that already, you know, like it, she already knows or he already knows, right? Yes. You're sweating bullets if you're on this website right now. Yeah, that's what and you're uh, waiting for that phone call. They were saying that on the news that they had a, I think it was a 19 or $20 fee to erase your data, Yeah, which is funny because your data wasn't actually erased. I mean, your data was erased, like the chats back and forth with your online uh friends, but your credit card information wasn't real. And that's what they stole, right? So they get your real name apparently from your credit card stuff. So, but Ashley Madison has gotten rid of apparently the 19 or $20. That's why I never signed up. That back end fee. It's like class B shares. <laughs> they get you every time with them. like those B shares, B free, share mutual funds. Free to get Nothing's in. Nothing's free up front, baby. Oh no, this is a free fund. You only pay like on the later part if you really want to leave, uh, but you're not going to want to leave. This yeah, one maybe so. gives you a fee on the back end and a rash. <laughs> and a divorce and, <laughs> and half your stuff. Yeah. Seriously, though, that is the way to capitalize on this data breach. If you're the hacker, you just call everybody and just go, I got your credit card number here. How much should I hit it for? It's so time intensive, though. <clears throat> How much is it worth to you? Is it yeah. worth five grand? Yeah. Well, for 25 me, grand. For me, it was worth it just not to participate. Right. But assuming that you already had. Yes. You know, if I make one phone call and some dude says, cool, it's you hit it for 1500 bucks. It's all I got available. I'm taking 1500 bucks. I'm deleting it and off I go. I just made $1,500 for a 20 minute phone call. That's yeah. a pretty good hourly rate. I was watching an episode of The Good Wife the other night and they had a hacker that locked up all their terminals, you know, in their whole office, got in the network and said, hey, and there's a countdown clock. Unless you give me X amount of money, I think it was 50 grand in this amount of time, like 48 hours, all your data is gone. And then they gave him the money and the countdown clock sped up. Nice. Yeah. They ended up, of course, because it's a TV show, they end up getting out of it. But Just unplug this. everything. Duh. But I started thinking about, well, no, because he's in the code. I mean, when you plug it back in, he's right back in. Just don't plug it in the internet. Ever. Well, I mean, you have to get new computers, but you can still salvage the stuff, right? 
Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, that's a Not big a, deal. There are companies and they're targeting smaller companies. We had Max Nomad on a few weeks ago. He talked mm -hmm. about, you know, a company with five computers is perfect, like a little insurance salesman, you know, independent insurance salesman, brokering a few different things. Just, man, go in there and wreak havoc. Huh. Yeah. Well, that's why I don't use any of those computer things. No. Ab Ab